Well, welcome everybody. So great to have you here, Sue. Thank you very much for that great introduction, and it's nice to be able to uh, spend more than five minutes with Mike Morrell. <laughs> <laughs> with all of you, as you know, those of you who watch CBS this morning, Mike is frequently on the air with Charlie Rose and Gail King, and he. He is one of the smartest people that we have on the air, and so this really is a great occasion. I'm glad you are here because this is a terrific, terrific book. I told Mike that I went through it when he came on our air when it first came out, and then I went back and read it more thoroughly, and it is eye-opening. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. Someone who reported during this period of time, but I learned more and more going through it, so congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Nora, and great to be with you all. Thank you for having me. So why did you write this book? You didn't want to. Um, you know, there's... There's really four reasons, two that I talk about in the book, and two that I didn't talk about in the book, but were just as important. Um, the first reason is I really do believe that this, this particular type of extremism that we're facing is gonna be with us for generations. You know, I say in the book that I think my children's generation and my grandchildren's generation is still gonna be fighting this fight, and I wanted to tell the American people about it. Um, at the time, I thought we were becoming complacent. ISIS hadn't hadn't arisen yet, right? Um, and I thought we were becoming complacent. Um, and I'm still a little afraid about that. So I wrote, I, I wanted to write the book to say, hey, the threat is real, it's out there, it's not going away anytime soon. The second reason is um, that, as I say in the book, there are a lot of myths out there about the CIA. Actually, I have to tell the story. You know, one of the myths is that senior CIA officials are dashing and rugged men like Harrison Ford <laughs> and Alec Baldwin and James Earl Jones. You know, the reality is that two years ago I got a rather short haircut and I walked through my front door and my teenage daughter took one look at me and said, Dad, you look like Forrest Gump. <laughs> so, the no Harrison Ford. So there's all these myths out there, right? One myth is kind of the James Bond myth, which is that we can do anything, right? Which is nonsense. We can't. Another myth is kind of the Maxwell Smart, sometimes New York Times myth, that we get everything wrong. There's nothing we get right, and that's nonsense. And there's another myth out there, there's kind of the Jason Bourne myth that, that we're a rogue agency, that we're doing all of these operations and covert actions without any, without any approval from the White House or support from Capitol Hill, nonsense. Um, and so I wanted to give Americans a more interesting and accurate picture of the CIA. So those are the two reasons I talk about in the book. Um, the two reasons I don't talk about in the book are number one, I really do believe that senior government officials have a responsibility to write a book about their experiences in government, um, what they saw, what they did, why they made the decisions they did. I think it's very important in our democracy. It's another check on our government. Um, I think in fact we're the one of the few countries in the world where people actually do that. And we've got the media, right? We have the fourth estate, that's extremely important, but I think it's also important for people to say, here's my experience, here's my perspective, um, and to be honest about it. Uh, and then the fourth reason is, when you read the book, you'll read the last chapter, and the last chapter really is about the commitment and dedication of CIA officers um, who sacrifice significantly for the nation, and there's some stories in there that I simply wanted to be able to tell, and I wanted to write the book for that reason too. What's the biggest threat to U.S. national security right now? It's still, it's still international terrorism. Um, and contrary to the front page of the paper, it's not ISIS. Right? The threats that ISIS pose are, number one, a threat to the stability of the Middle East. So the same kind of threat to the territorial integrity of Syria that we've seen and the territorial integrity of Iraq, there's a risk of that spilling over to the rest of the region to Jordan, to Saudi Arabia, um, that's the number one risk they pose. In terms of the threat to the homeland, um, the threat is, the threat exists, but it's not significant, right? They can do two things. They can direct Americans who have gone to Syria and Iraq to fight for them. They can direct them back to conduct an attack here, probably a pretty small attack. Or they can, or they can, um, radicalize young men and young women who are in the United States who never left this country, radicalize them with a very powerful narrative and a, and, and a Madison Avenue style quality social media. Which is why we've seen these recent arrests in exactly. New York recently. Exactly, arrests all over the place, the, the attempted attack in Dallas, the attack on New York City police officers with the hatchet, the guy with the hatchet. Um, you'll see those kind of attacks, that's ISIS inspired, but again, nothing big, right? The real terrorist threat today, the most significant terrorist threat, still comes from Al-Qaeda. And it primarily comes from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in Yemen. 
um, a very sophisticated group, stronger today because of the uh, Yemeni civil war than they've ever been before. Um, more guys um, working for them than ever before, more money than ever before. Um, they're getting territory back for the first time since 2012 after President Hadi took it away from them. The last three attempted attacks in the United States of America by an outside terrorist group or by Al Qaeda in Yemen, uh, if I, I say in the book, and I think I've said on CBS this morning, if they brought down an airliner tomorrow in the United States of America, I would not be surprised. I think most Americans would. Um, the course, something called the Khorasan Group, um, which is associated with the Al-Nusra Group in Syria. So you've got two Islamic extremist groups in Syria, right? You've got ISIS and you've got this Al-Nusra Group. And this Khorasan Group is associated with Al-Nusra. And they pose a threat. So the reason you can't, the reason you have to take your laptop out at the airport is because the Khorasan Group figured out a way to put explosives into a laptop. So Al-Qaeda still poses the greatest threat, terrorist threat to the homeland. So just this week we had big news because a drone strike killed the number two Al-Qaeda leader in Yemen. How significant was that? Huge, right? Because he was not only the number two Al-Qaeda leader globally. So when bin Laden died, Ayman Zawahiri, bin Laden's longtime number two, becomes the number one. And he looks around and says, who's going to be my number two? And he picks this guy in Yemen named <coughs> Wahishi. So not only was he the number two Al-Qaeda guy globally, but he was the number one Al-Qaeda guy in Yemen for 12 years, leading this very sophisticated group. But he was quickly replaced. He's quickly replaced, but when you take out leaders, and it's important to take them out in as rapid succession as possible, when you take them out, two things happen. The first thing that happens is you create a disruption within the organization. Wahishi led AQAP for 11 years. Right? It's not easily replaced, right? E easily to name a replacement, but not easy to replace in terms of managing the day-to-day -day operations. And then the second thing, the second thing that happens is they have to start worrying about their security. And when you have to worry about your security, when you're looking above you all the time, it makes you less effective at running your organization and at planning terrorist attacks against the United States. Here's my uh, reporter question. I remember when President Obama and the announcement that uh, the U.S. had killed Osama bin Laden and the CIA director, or Brennan was not the CIA director then. Panetta was. Panetta was. But I remember them, Brennan saying, we cut the head off the snake. Right. Al Qaeda's been designated. But to cut the head off the snake, I mean, this thing just keeps growing. Yeah. So two comments. Um, you're absolutely right. Two comments. One is, if you look back to 9-11 and from a kind of 50,000 foot level and say, um, okay, how have we done in this war ag ag against extremism? It, this particular kind of extremism, which I think is fair to call Islamic extremism. Let's not kid ourselves here. Um, and the answer is we've had two significant victories in that war. They've had, <coughs> they've had one significant victory. Our two victories have been the protection of the homeland. So no outside group has attacked us successfully since 9-11, despite multiple efforts to do so. And then the second significant victory for us has been the degradation, decimation of the Al-Qaeda group in Pakistan, the Al-Qaeda senior leadership that brought that terror to our shores on 9-11. Their significant victory has been the spread of their ideology. So on September 10th, 2001, essentially at one place on the planet, Afghanistan. Today, northern Nigeria, Mali, Niger, Mauritania, across all of North Africa, East Africa, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, still Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. That's been their great victory. The second thing I'd say is, it's gonna sound funny coming from me, is that we cannot capture and kill our way to success. We cannot capture and kill our way to victory. Right? We, have to, we have to capture and kill our way to protect ourselves from guys who are trying to kill us, but somehow we have to get our arms around the problem of them putting guys on the battlefield as fast as we're taking them off. Okay, insider perspective. So we learned this week that that drone strike on the number two leader in Al Qaeda in Yemen was a signature strike. That means the CIA didn't learn until after that they got this guy. They didn't even know that he was there. Yeah, so I gotta be careful here. I can't, there's some certain things I can't talk about. Um, this is one of them, types of strikes. Why? Because it's considered <laughs> classified. <laughs> To put not too fine a so, point so sometimes there are drone strikes where you know the leader is there, and sometimes you just go after where there's militant activity? Yeah, that's what I can't talk about. 
can't talk because about that. Because that would different. reveal sources of information? It might, it, it might I, yeah, it might help the bad guys. Okay, all right. But well, let me ask you this then. Would it be, um, is that common that you might not know if the head person is there, that Wahashi was not there? Waihishi, rather. Yes, it might be common. Um, <laughs> we're gonna dig. We're gonna dig back into a lot of the the hot spots. She's good, isn't she? Hot, hot spots around the world. See, this is the fascinating <laughs> stuff. The insider. I mean, people would love to be inside that room. We only see it from the Hollywood perspective. Um, how did I want to get a little? Because his bio is so interesting. Yeah. How did you wind up in the CIA? Yeah. So um, I was in the Oval Office once. This is another little story. I was in the Oval Office once, and President Bush was was railing on intellectuals. This is George W. Bush. George W. Bush, he was complaining about intellectuals. And he was really just trying to drive Condi Rice out of her mind. Um, and in the middle of his rant, he turns to me and he says, Michael, you're not an intellectual, are you? And I said, Mr. President, University of Akron. <laughs> 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 so I went to the University of Akron, um, I majored in economics, um, I loved economics, I wanted to go to grad school, get a PhD and teach. I so loved economics. But I had a professor, economics professor, who I think did some work for the CIA and encouraged me to apply. I was never able to find out because he died early in life, so I was never really able to talk to him about it. Um, you mean whether he recruited you? Yes, exactly. Wow. Um, but I sent them a resume and they said, come to Washington for an interview. I was this middle class kid from Ohio. I had never been to Washington, D.C. So I thought, hey, I'll go to Washington, free trip to our nation's capital, I'll see our nation's capital, I'll say no to any job offer, and I'm off to the University of Chicago to, to get a PhD in economics. And I went to the agency for two days and I was blown away by the mission, by the capabilities of the organization, by the people I met, and they said, and you know this graduate school thing? We'll take care of that, we'll pay for that, something that they ended up doing. So I said yes and never looked back. And you ended up serving 33 years and six presidents. Mm -hmm. How did you end up so close to George Tenet? So I was, when George came to the agency as the deputy director, I was running the staff that produced the president's daily brief. So I edited that um, and prepared it for the senior leadership at CIA to sign off on it before it could be given to the president the next day. Um, and so I, bumped in, I had bumped into George now and then. Um, roughly the same time, um, Secretary Rubin and Deputy Secretary Summers at Treasury were complaining about the intelligence community's collection of economic information from other countries, saying it wasn't necessary, it, diplomatic risk, et cetera, et cetera. So George asked me to look into it because I had an economics background. Um, and so I did the study for him, and it came to the conclusion that Rubin and Summers were right. We didn't need to do that. Um, and George was impressed by the work, and when he needed an executive assistant, he asked me to take the job, and the um, best two years of my life were working for George Tennant, because he, he's not only uh, gets a lot of work done, but he's a lot of fun to work for. So here's one of the interesting things, I don't know how many of you know about this, about the presidential daily brief, that the President of the United States gets a daily briefing from the, the CIA. How many, how many people work on that? How is it prepared? How many people get to see that? I mean, it's the best intelligence that our government has every day. How would you describe it? So um, the way it gets produced is there's a meeting every morning, um, and people say, here's what we think we have to offer. And somebody says, that sounds great. That doesn't. Um, that would sound great if you did it this way rather than that. So there's, there's that kind of meeting. And you end up with six or seven one to two page pieces for the president on every possible national security issue and challenge, national security threat and challenge you could think of. And who sits in on those briefings? So in that, in that meeting in the morning, it, it's, it's the leadership of the analytics side of the agency. And then the rest of the day, the analysts are writing the piece and maps are being produced and graphics are being produced um, and the pieces are being edited by more layers of review than you could possibly imagine. Um, and then it's delivered the next morning by a briefer. And who in the White House gets to see the people? So when I briefed President Bush, in the room were the President, the Vice President, National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, the White House Chief of Staff um, at the time, Andy Card, and the Director of CIA and me. So that was it in the White House. Um, 
depending on who pre who's the president, um, the president decides the dissemination list. So when you first sit down with a president-elect and you talk about the PDB, you say, Mr. President, you get to decide who gets this. It can just be you or it can be more than you. So for President Clinton, it was about 25 people. Really? For President Bush, number 43, it was probably 10 people. For President Obama, it's probably about 15. But they decide. And does that color at all how much information you, you put betcha in it? You betcha it does. Yeah. See, and President, <laughs> President Bush understood that. And yeah. so it fell on me when somebody wanted to be added, right? When somebody who worked for him at a very senior level wanted to be added, it fell to me to ask the president. Wow. And so I would ask President Bush, can this person be added or that person be added? And he pushed me really hard, right? Why do they need to know? Um, and he would say to me, because the more people, the more people who you give this to, the more you're going to water it down. I'm going to talk with Mike Morell about the presidential daily brief before 9-11 because Mike was the person who briefed uh, President George W. Bush when he became president. But first, because we have you here and you've spent so much time with presidents, I mean, it really is extraordinary how, how much time he spent speaking back and forth with presidents and getting a sense of them. I want to get your assessment. How would you assess President George W. Bush? So much, much, much smarter than um, he is given credit for. Um, and it's, a, it, it's not an intellectual smarts, it's gut smarts, it's street smarts. Um, I found his gut reaction to issues to be right on the mark. Um, very quick to make a decision. Again, the use of the gut, right? Very quick to make a decision. Some people believe too quick to make a decision. Um, voracious appetite for intelligence. Um, absorbed information best by talking about it, by having a conversation like this, as opposed to reading it in depth. President Obama, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Brilliant, intellectually brilliant. Um, takes a little bit longer to make a decision, because he's asking all sorts of questions. Right? He doesn't want to make a decision until he knows the answer to every one of the questions. Some people think he takes too long to make a decision. Um, again, voracious appetite for intelligence, um, but not somebody who absorbs information best by a conversation, somebody who absorbs it best by reading it um, in detail, right, by himself. You've said one of that strength is actually one of his weaknesses, is that he doesn't decide as quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Cheney. Um, cares deeply, deeply, deeply about national security. Um, was even more voracious appetite for intelligence than, than President Bush or President Obama. Um, he sat through an hour PDB briefing of his own before he ever joined me in the Oval Office as a president. So spent a lot of time. Every day? With his own, with, with his own briefer, yes. Do most vice presidents do that? Uh, I don't spend that kind of time. I don't spend that kind of time. So intelligence was extremely important to him. Um, but one of the things I say in the book, um, you know, I'm just, and, and, and I'm just straight about this, is that uh, Vice President Cheney and his staff overstated some of the intelligence with regard to Iraq before the Iraq War, and the Vice President in particular um, overstated the relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda prior to the war. In fact, you have said that you felt pressure from the Vice President's office about the relationship between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. And we put out a paper. I was then the number three on the analytic side of the agency in the run-up to the Iraq War. We put out a paper on what the relationship was. Um, what we basically said in that paper was, look, there were some historical contacts, some historical discussions between Al-Qaeda and the Iraqi intelligence service, but there was no relationship today, or there was no relationship prior to 9-11. There was no Iraqi um, involvement in support for foreknowledge of nothing. Right? Saddam was just as surprised as we all were. Um, as we said, um, the vice president, even after that, the vice president's chief of staff, when that paper came out, called my boss. This the, is Scooter Libby. This is Scooter Libby calling my boss, the then number three in the agency, head of analysis, and said, withdraw the paper, it's wrong. Right? And we refused. That's what good analysts do, is they don't get pressured. They don't get pressured into saying, and that wants paper said there say. was no relationship between Al Qaeda and Iraq. Um, 
And President Bush did something really, really, really important with regard to that story. So my boss, every Christmas Eve, gave the PDD briefer, the President's Daily Briefer, a day off, and she went and did the briefer briefing herself. And about four weeks, Christmas Eve was about four weeks after this whole episode took place with Scooter Libby. And she briefed the President at Camp David, and she got up to leave, and the President said, Jamie, Jamie, um, you know, I know about the Scooter Libby business. I know about it, you know, the, the whole issue of Iraq and Al-Qaeda. I just want to tell you I want you to continue. I have your back. I have your back. I want you to continue to call it like you see it. I want your analysts to continue to call them like you see them. It was an incredibly important thing for a president to do. I just want to put a finer point on this. So um, Mike gave the PDB to the president six days a week. And you got into the office at what time? So prior to 9-11, Prior to 9-11, I got up at 3 to get to work at 4 for an 8 o'clock briefing. After 9-11, I got up at 12.30 to get to work at 1.30 for an 8 o'clock briefing. There was something... And you have a wife and three kids, and how old were your three kids? So my kids were young at the time. They were, they were like between two, 2 and 5 or 2 and 6. Um, I thought when I said yes to this job that this was going to work out perfectly you know, for a guy with a young family because I'd be home you know, for a big chunk of the day. I went home at noon. I'd be home for a big chunk of the day, but I, I didn't realize how tired. how tired I would be and the stress of the job. And Admit it, you never changed a diaper. <laughs> no, <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> That's okay, you are, you are forgiven. Somebody asked my wife once what the worst year of her life was, and without hesitation, she said the year your father briefed. Yeah, briefing the President yeah. of the United States. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. What's your sense of her? I know you didn't deliver yeah. uh, a, a PDB to her. Yeah. Was she one of the people that, that got access to the PDB under President Clinton? Yes. So yeah. she saw the but PDB every morning. Was that the only only first lady that, that had access? Oh, did she have it as, as, as first lady? As first I don't lady. think so. No, okay. No, I don't think so. But the, as the Secretary of State, she Absolutely. Was. Okay. Um, Hillary Clinton. Um, smart, really smart. Tough on national security. Real tough on national security. Uh, a lot warmer than people give her credit for. Um, so when, when Dave Petraeus left, there were two people competing to be CIA director, John Brennan and Michael Morrell. Interestingly, I recommended, I, I recommended to the president that he hire John, and John recommended that he hire me. <laughs> um, and I didn't get the job, right? And this was right after she had fallen and hit her head. And so she was out for about 10 days. So she comes back to work the day after the president's made a decision that I'm not going to get the job. She walks into the Situation Room. And it was the first time she was back in the Situation Room in 10 days. And everybody's saying, welcome back, Madam Secretary. How are you feeling? She doesn't respond to anybody. She walks across the room to me. She puts her hand on my arm, and she says, are you OK? So she, she's a lot warmer than, uh, than, the, than uh, is commonly believed. And just uh, quickly, and we'll move on, but you know, it's, we have, since we have a presidential race coming up, how would you, you know, voters will look to candidates on a lot of domestic issues. I mean, how would you sort of judge when you, when you look at these, who, who would be a good president in terms of dealing with national security issues? What's the temperament, the intellectual capacity, experience, knowledge? Look, these are really, really, really tough issues. Um, I get frustrated when I read 8, 10, 12 paragraph op-eds that claim to solve the Syria problem or the Iran problem or the ISIS problem, even though I write some of these op-eds. <laughs> um, because these are really tough problems, right? Um, and so you really need somebody who, who is willing to listen to other people, can ask really good questions. Um, is willing to think through all of the options and all of the consequences associated with what the policy options are. Um, I'm, also, I'm also kind of a George Shultz kind of foreign policy guy. You know, George Shultz says that actually national security and foreign policy is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, say what you mean. You know, if, if you believe that, that Iran is a terrorist state, say it. Don't play games, say it. Um, do what you say. Do what you say. Um, the U.S. Is, is not a country that can bluff. You say something, do it, and carry a big stick. And everything kind of falls into place. 
Um, so that's what I kind of look for. Uh, you mentioned it, Iran. I want to get you on some of the other big topics. Um, Iran, uh, it is June 18th. The deadline is June 30th uh, for a deal. Um, do you think it will happen? And two, what about the criticism that by um, lifting sanctions or easing sanctions, that means billions of dollars and money back to Iran, which is the chief destabilizer in the region, the chief funder of Hezbollah as well as other groups? So I the way I think about this is, what would I be saying to the president if I were in my old job? Right? And I would have, I think, three, three things to say. Um, one, is, one is, with regard to the deal, I would want to be able to tell him two things. One is, the deal you have in your hands, how much does it push them back in terms of being able to get to a weapon? Right, right now, they're two to three months away from producing enough fissile material for one bomb if they decide to do that. I'd want to be able to tell him, we're confident it would push them 12 to 15 months or eight months. I'd want to be able to tell him that. Secondly, I'd want to be able to tell him, Mr. President, here's how much confidence I have that if they cheat on the deal, that I'll be able to see it and be able to tell you. Oh, that's right. Cool. And I can't, I can't answer either one of those questions right now because I don't know what the deal is. Because we say this is the deal, but the Iranians keep on saying, well, that's not part of it. That's not part of it. That's not part of it. So I don't know what the deal is, so I can't tell you what I would specifically say, but I would have to be able to answer those two questions for him, number one. Number two is I would want to make sure that he has a really good understanding, this is to get to your question, that he has a really good understanding of the bigger context here. Right? And the bigger context is exactly what Nora said, which is that the nuclear problem isn't the only problem we have with the Iranians. We got a bunch of problems with these guys. One is they want to become the hegemonic power in the Middle East. They want to call the shots. They want to reestablish the Persian Empire. Um, two is they're one of the few countries in the world that still practice terrorism as a tool of statecraft. The IRGC Quds Force conducts terrorism around the world, largely against Jewish interests, um, but also against the interests of Sunni Arab states. They tried to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the United States in a Georgetown restaurant and that went to the highest levels of the Iranian government. They support international terrorist groups, Hezbollah. Hezbollah could not exist without the support it gets from Iran. It is Iranian state policy to, it is Iranian state policy that, uh, that Israel be wiped off the face of the planet. The Supreme Leader talks about it all the time. And lastly, they, they, they provide support to regional insurgent groups. They, pr they, they provide support right now to the Houthis who are fighting the legitimate government of Yemen. So there's a lot of things this country does that we don't like, and it's not just the nuclear issue. I think that's the fundamental difference between the President of the United States and Prime Minister Netanyahu. The President is focused on the nuclear issue. Why? Because that's what the sanctions are all about, that's what the P5 plus one came together to negotiate, and the Prime Minister is focused on all these other things that Iran does. And he's looking at these sanctions and he's saying, hey, these sanctions are pretty nice. Let's keep those sanctions in place until their behavior changes. So I want the president to understand the bigger context and how a deal would affect the bigger context. And it affects it in two ways, I think. One is it gives them more money, right, to do all this bad stuff. And the other thing it does is it gives them some credibility. Cutting a deal with the United States of America gives you some credibility. You're ha giving the president a signature foreign policy achievement? Mm -hmm. So um, those, are the, those are the things I'd want to make sure that he, that he knew. The number one threat, national security threat to the United States, you have said is terrorism, chiefly by Al Qaeda. What is the number two national security threat? Cyber. And cyber is, cyber is really not a threat, right? Cyber is a vector through which adversaries attack you. Um, best way to think about it, I think, is who are the adversaries and what do they want? What are they trying to do through cyber? And there's really, there's a lot of adversaries, but to break it down, there's three, the three most important, nation states. When I give a talk on cyber, I start by saying, who has the best, who has the best cyber capabilities on the planet? Who and, does? And people say, people yell out Russia or China, and I say, no, the United States of America. Right? If you knew what I know, you wouldn't plug in your toaster. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's not a joke. 
All right, so the United States, Great Britain, Israel, fantastic cyber capabilities, right? Then a gap to Russia and China. Russia a little bit more sophisticated. China throws its biggest, its biggest resource at the problem, people. What are the Russians after? National defense information. That's what we're after, right? You shouldn't worry about that. That's a spy game, right? Um, and they're preparing for cyber war. So they're putting tools inside networks so that if we, ever start, if we ever have a hot war between the United States and Russia, they'll turn it into a cyber war. You know, we're preparing for that too, quite frankly. China does both of those things and it does something else. It actually steals intellectual property from Western companies on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars a year and gives it to its companies. We don't do that. We have never done that. Um, and, then so, and then you've got Iran and North Korea which actually use cyber as a, as a asymmetric tool in war against us. So the attacks against New York financial institutions several years ago, Iran. The attack against Sony, North Korea. And the other issue on the nation state side is that more and more countries are getting involved in this because the tools you need to get inside networks, to steal data from networks, and to do damage to networks are increasingly available on the gray market. And Intelligent services that can't afford to build those tools themselves are just buying them. So more nation states are getting into it. Second, adversary criminal groups. Cyber crime now generates more money than the illicit drug trade. Cyber crime now generates more money than the, than the illicit drug trade. And it's, it runs the gamut, right, from freezing up your photographs and demanding $129 to unfreeze them, right, to stealing, to stealing, um, personally identifiable information and hacking your bank account. Um, and then the last, the last threat, the last adversary is the, is, is the most dangerous. And it's the insider threat. It's people inside your company, inside your organization, who for some reason get mad at you, get angry with you, and they want to take it out on you. Edward right? Snowden. Edward Snowden is the, is the exact example of that. What about people, though, that say that Edward Snowden did somewhat of a service by exposing the massive surveillance that the government is involved in that most Americans did not know and that that has caused a re-examination so, within the government? So I, got, I, I, I think I've got like three responses to that. <laughs> you uh, got three responses. <laughs> I got three responses. Um, one is that he stole millions and millions and millions of documents, most of which had absolutely nothing to do with the Section 215 telephone metadata program. Um, second is that it takes an awful lot of arrogance to say that I know better than two presidents, than multiple intelligence communities, than, than, than multiple intelligence committees across multiple Congresses, and multiple judges on the FISA court. It takes a lot, it takes a lot of arrogance to say I know better than all those people. And then the last thing I'll say is that, is that you know, he says he did what he did to protect privacy and civil liberties. He says that he wanted the American people, he wanted all of you to decide whether we should be doing those things or not. Well, if that's true, then I believe that he should also believe that you should also judge his actions in this regard, that the American people should judge his actions in this regard. And that means he should come home and be judged, right? And he's not coming home. He's not coming home. Um, I would be comfortable. Let me say this. I've, I've, I've never said this before. If he came back and stood in, a, stood in front of a jury of his peers and they said, you're innocent, I'd be fine with that. I'd be fine with that because then he's being judged. Let me get you on this. In fact, you say that the telephone metadata collection doesn't even go far enough. You'd like the power to be more sweeping. Can you explain why? You, you've explained this to me before. When people say, I don't understand why you need numbers and to keep a track record of all of those calls made. That just seems so massive, such sweeping surveillance. Why is that necessary? Yeah, so let me do this two ways. Um, not three, two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, you're, if the British are surveilling a known terrorist in London, and they're watching him because they want to find out who else he's connected to before they arrest him. And it's always a tough question in the terrorism game. When do you arrest the guy? 
and that person says under surveillance in the UK that I want to conduct an attack in the United States. What's the first thing you want to know if you're the President of the United States? Is he connected to anybody in the United States? The telephone metadata program allows you to answer that question like that. And if you find out that that guy in the UK is actually connected to Nora, what's the next question you want to know? Who's Nora talking to? Because this is a broader conspiracy or not. The program allows you to answer that question like that. Right, another example, Boston Marathon bombing happens. What's the first question you have? Is there going to be multiple bombings across the country? Is this a conspiracy? The program allows you to answer that question. Are these two guys connected to that in any way? Right? So it allows you to do that. Um, the other thing I'd say about it is that, is that we're talking here about the telephone number that did the calling, the telephone number that was called, and the duration of the call. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not the person who called, not the person that was called, not whose phone called, not the content. It's nothing. The only thing are those three things, right? When Snowden- What about it's a text message? No, it's, just, it's the same thing. It's the, it's the metadata, right? It's the metadata. Um, when this was disclosed, I remember watching CNN, and CNN kept on saying over and over again, I, it actually ran a banner all day long. It ran a banner all day long that said, um, American public under surveillance. And they kept on saying over and over again something like, when you call your grandmother in Arkansas, NSA knows. No, they don't. No, they don't. So this was this overhyped. Um, the media often goes to the darkest corner of the room in reporting on intelligence issues because they often don't know the, all the facts. Um, and so I think, I actually say in the book that I think the media's handling of this actually created some of the public angst about, about surveillance um, and the real risk to privacy and civil liberties. When I say it should be broader, here's what I mean. Not every telephone call is in that database. I can't tell you what percentage is, but not every telephone call is. And, not, and, and no emails are, right? So let me, let me suggest this to you. If there was an Al-Qaeda cell in the United States and they were dispersed and they were talking to each other via email and tomorrow they conducted a 9-11 style attack, I think the American people would say, well, wh why didn't you see this? Why weren't you monitoring their emails? Why wasn't this part of this program? Um, I want to ask you about 9-11 uh, because you were uh, briefing President George W. Bush and you were with him on the morning of 9-11. Can you, can you describe that day and what happened? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to say it is it, it was a combination of the intensity of doing my job with the surreal. So an example of the intensity of doing my job, um, on the flight from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, the president asked to see me. It was the first time he really had a chance to, to step back and take a breath and, and, and think for a second. The president had been reading to school children, remember, and Andy Card whispered, his chief of staff whispered in his ear, and then the president was quickly shuttled right. around to these bases from right. Barksdale and then exactly. to Offutt. So then he calls Mike in. And he says, Michael, who did this? And, 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 and so it was the president, me, and Andy Card, White House Chief of Staff. Um, he says, Michael, who did this? And I said, Mr. President, I haven't seen any intelligence that would tell me who did this. So you know, the best I can do is give you my opinion. And he said, I understand, now get on with it. I understand your caveat, now get on with it. I said, Mr. President, there's two countries in the world who have the capability to do this, Iraq and Iran, um, but both of them have nothing to gain and everything to lose from doing so. I said, no, Mr. President, I think that the trail will lead to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. In fact, I told him I would bet my children's future on that. I've never told my kids that. Please don't tell them. <laughs> um, and then he said, Michael, when will we know? Um, it's, a great kind of, it's, it's a great example of a kind of question a president asks you, yeah. right? And, and you can't say, here's when you're gonna know, because you don't know, right? So what I did was give him context. That's what, that's what analysts do, is they give presidents context. And the context in this case was, 
to tell him, here's how long it took us to know who did it in the case of the East Africa bombings, in the case of the coal bombing, and in the case of the Kobar Towers bombing. And, and, and it varied dramatically in each of those three cases. So I told him about each one of those, and I said, so Mr. President, we may know soon, and then again, it may be a while. Um, and so that's an example of the intensity of doing my job that day. Um, and if you read the book, it's really a worthwhile about then how the president actually finds out, and it wasn't Mike Morrell who told the president, and Mike was very, very angry about that. And that's, I'll leave that section to the book because I want to get through this. You know, because for me, I covered this as a reporter, but to go back and read this section was very, very difficult to read, even though we knew some of this material, but to see it again in print. I mean, this wasn't a total surprise. I mean, from late April to early July of 2001, you guys at the CIA were picking up worrisome intelligence. And here's just some examples for all of you. On April 19th, there was an analysis titled, Bin Laden Planning Multiple Operations. Other pieces were titled, Bin Laden Attacks May Be Eminent, and Bin Laden Planning High Profile Attacks. You, the President saw these months, months before 9-11. Who was most skeptical of that analysis? I don't think anybody was skeptical. I remember it was frustrating. It was very frustrating because... I guess here's... I was stunned to read that Vice President Cheney yeah. and Rumsfeld were very skeptical. Yeah, so, so it, it, I, think, I think people at DOD were skeptical. Um, I think the Vice President asked a legitimate question, which is, could these guys just be playing with us? Right? Could they just be putting out this information and trying to get us to spend all this money to raise our guard and, right, and raise all these resources? Because that was Osama bin Laden's goal, was to drag us down right, in the Middle East. Right, right. So I think that was a legitimate question. I do think people at DOD were skeptical. But in response to that skepticism, we wrote, you had a we briefing prepared titled, UBL threats are real. Mm -hmm. That was the response and, to the vice president's question. And after you delivered that to President George W. Bush, what did he say to you? Um, he said, um, what did he say? <laughs> in the book, you write, OK, Michael, you've covered your ass. Right. And, and how many months before 9/11 was that? So that was um, it was probably it was you know a right. handful of months, right? April to whatever it was, May, whatever it was. Um, but as I say in the book, you know the president, the president was deeply worried about this threat reporting. He said that to me as a joke. I'm okay, absolutely no, convinced know. of that. I know. He and said you, that to me as a joke. And you explain it in context in yes. the book and why you why you why you right. Why well, you put that in print is to sort of say what sort of happened, and that's because there was some misreporting. Because I don't know how many remember, but after 9/11, there was that we all learned about that famous August 6 PDB, the Presidential Daily Briefing, which has since been declassified. The only presidential the first the first first right, the first, first presidential one. daily briefing to be declassified. And the title of that, and remember, this is just one month before 9/11, was was titled "Bin Laden Determined to Strike in the U.S." Why? wasn't this a hair on fire report? Yeah. Why wasn't an, an action inducing yeah, report? Yeah, great question. Um, so where did it come from, right? So any time that we showed the president one of those pieces, the titles of which Nora read off, he would always ask, is there any indication that the attack could be here in the homeland? Every time. And George Tenet's answer and my answer to that question was always the same. No, there isn't any indication, but bin Laden would like nothing more than to bring the fight here. So we can't rule it out. So he asked that question over and over again. So one of the, one of the many secrets about life in government is, is that um, it's not that much different than life anywhere else. People go on vacation in August. And because people, because analysts and collectors go on vacation in August, there's less good stuff to show the president in the PDB. And so you have to plan ahead to have good stuff to show the president. So I was meeting with every office to say, okay, what are you gonna write for the president in August? And when I talked to the counterterrorism analyst, I said, you know, he keeps on asking this question. Could we write a piece for him that talks about bin Laden's ambitions to strike us here in the homeland? And so they did, and that's the, that's the August 6th PDB. And it simply, it simply talks about bin Laden wanting to attack us here, and it talks about the times in the past when he actually tried to do so, um, most prominently around the millennium, when when there was an attack planned against LAX, and a guy was 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 arrested coming across the border from Canada into Washington, Washington State. Um, there was nothing in the piece that said we have any threat reporting that 
there's an ongoing plot against the United States, and there was nothing in the piece that said, you know, that threat reporting we talked about earlier in the year, we're concerned that that might be in the United States. There was nothing it, about hijacking airlines? There was nothing, right? There was nothing that was actionable, and so I, in briefing it, did not treat it as a hair on fire, action-inducing piece, and he didn't read it that way either. So let me ask you this then, do you think, then the following question is, do you think President Obama is currently receiving briefings that, saying, that say Al Qaeda determined to strike in the US or ISIS determined to strike in the US? So I don't know, because I'm not there. Um, <coughs> but during my time there, we had plenty of that kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, the, I, I start the book by telling the story of just as I was leaving government, we had the, what I thought was the most serious Al Qaeda threat to the United States since the two August 2006 attempt to bring down 10 to 15 airliners flying from London Heathrow's airport to the United States, which is why you can't take liquids on the plane anymore, right? Um, I thought this was the most significant threat. So we were writing pieces like that in August of 2013. And those pieces said that there was? There was, again, they were very similar, right? That Al Qaeda in Yemen was plotting a major attack, possibly simultaneous attacks, against U.S. interests somewhere. The homeland, maybe. Yemen, maybe. Somewhere else in the Gulf, maybe. Right? But again, frustratingly lacking in time, place, method. So, and this would involve al Asiri, who we call the bomb maker, who is in Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Is he our top target? Yeah, so I think, I, I say in the book, he's the most dangerous terrorist on the planet. Um, so he is the bomb maker for Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Um, he was responsible for the very sophisticated bombs that the Unabomber ha had, not the Unabomber, the underwear, the, uh, bomber. the underwear bomber had in December of, of 2009, the so-called printer cartridge plot um, to put an explosive inside of printer cartridge designed to bring down two two cargo planes in, in 2010, and the so-called non-metallic suicide vest plot, which is explosives in, in a shirt with no metallic parts, 2011. He designed an explosive to put in his brother's rectum designed to kill the Saudi Minister of Interior, and his brother sat right next to the Saudi Minister of Interior, much closer than Nora and I are sitting when he detonated that explosive splattering himself all over the room and not putting a scratch on the minister. That minister is now <coughs> the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. He was just appointed, his name is Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, is one of the most powerful men in Saudi Arabia right now. He survived an assassination attempt. And, and you know, physicists explain the fact that he wasn't scratched um, by the direction of the explosion and all this other stuff, right? Um, the prince told me that he thinks God saved him to continue his fight against Al-Qaeda, to continue to protect the kingdom against Al-Qaeda. I'm going with the prince. <laughs> 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 um, we have a lot of your questions here, and I want to get to all of them because I know um, they're very good uh, questions. But um, thank you, Michael, for, for all thank of that. You, thank you, thank you. Um, Good questions here first. Did the White House ever cherry pick or selectively pick CIA information to justify their war strategy in Iraq in the presentation before Congress and the UN? So, so yes, we just talked about what Vice President Cheney's office did and what Vice President Cheney did with regard to the link between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Um, I never saw the President do that. Um, I saw other administration officials do it um, publicly and before Congress. Um, but in terms of Secretary Powell's UN speech, everything that Secretary Powell said to the UN was what we believed, was what the intelligence analysts believed. But you use this book for the first time to apologize to Secretary Powell all these years later. Why? Because. I think Secretary Powell is a remarkable man. I think he's, he's served his country with extraordinary distinction in multiple jobs over a long period of time. Um, and this, this Iraq WMD thing has been hung around his neck. What specifically and are you apologizing for? 
for the fact that we got it wrong. You know, we said, we said, CIA, US intelligence community, quite frankly, every intelligence service around the world that looked at this question said that Saddam has chemical weapons, Saddam has a biological weapons production capability, and Saddam is reconstituting his nuclear weapons program. We believed it, and we were wrong. So that's what I was apologizing about. And I had heard him say to people two things. One is, this Iraq WMD thing's gonna be on my tombstone. And I heard him say that, you know, nobody from CIA ever apologized to me. And so I wanted to apologize. And I didn't want him, him to be surprised that I apologized, so I sent him that chapter in advance. He called me, um, we talked for about 45 minutes, and he was deeply appreciative of the apology. Was, um, the CIA has a lot of intelligence assets, but the largest organization within the government that has intelligence assets is the Defense Department, correct? Yes, very good, excellent, <laughs> excellent. So was there- Those should be moved over to the CIA, <laughs> you see. <laughs> well, the reason I, I bring that up is because Secretary Cheney had been Secretary of Defense, Secretary Rumsfeld had been Secretary of Defense twice, um, and was, so were they able to use the assets of the Defense Department to produce other information that was different from, counter to, produced a different narrative, no. or add to what the CIA's analysis was? So the formal intelligence pieces of the Department of Defense are part of the intelligence community. Um, Defense Intelligence Agency, Air Force Intelligence, Marine Corps Intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but were they cherry picking? No, they, no, so, so, so the, they believed what we believed. They didn't say anything they didn't believe. Um, one, uh, one senior Defense Department official did create his own analytic unit, right, to do his own analysis, his own intelligence analysis. Um, and that was highly unusual. I've never seen that before. Who was that? So that was um, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Carbone? I forget his name. Carbone? No. Um, but somebody else. <laughs> and that's highly unusual, right? And they produced analysis that was inconsistent with what the intelligence community was saying. All right, uh, next question. Do you think the U.S. government should seize social media accounts that are linked to ISIS in the name of national and global security? No, because, um, because of the nature of the internet, if you shut down ISIS in one place on the internet, they pop up somewhere else two hours later. It is very difficult to it's very difficult to do something like that. So no, I wouldn't advocate that. Does their use of social media help us in finding them and tracking them down? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what circumstances do you see focus, fav, rather, what circumstances do you see favoring an Israeli first strike on Iran? You know, when we were talking about Iran before, um, I said there were three things that I would make sure I, President knew if I was in my old job, and I said two of them, I didn't say the third. The third is, I would have my analysts make sure that they thought through, okay, what are all the alternatives here? What are all the alternatives to a deal? And what are the upsides and downsides of each of the alternatives? And that's a job for CIA analysts. And what are the alternatives, right? Well, one alternative is that you kick the can down the road. You continue to negotiate. I think that's the most likely outcome, by the way. And, and so you, they continue to have their program f basically frozen, and you continue to negotiate with the same set of sanctions. That's option one, mm. right? That's alternative one. Alternative two is that the negotiations break down. And they go, and you walk away from the table, and you might turn up the sanctions to put additional pressure on them so you can try to get a better deal. That's what some people are arguing for. But what happens in that case is that they go, they start back up their program back up, right? And they go from then two to three months away from enough fissile material for a weapon to maybe four to six weeks. So they shrink that time. Well, how good is our intelligence in terms of knowing how far away they are? It's pretty good, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. It's not perfect, it's pretty good. Um, and then the other option is going to war. The other option is attacking their nuclear facilities. Okay, what are the implications of that? Well, there's actually a debate going on inside of Iran about whether they should develop a weapon or not. The hardliners, conservative hardliners, think, hey, we need a weapon. And some other people are saying, hey, we think this is a bad idea, right? Um, if, if the United States or Israel attacked Iran, I believe, and my analysts two years ago believed, 
I don't know what they believe today, but two years ago they believed that that would only strengthen the hand of the hardliners in that debate, almost guaranteeing that Iran would develop a weapon. See, we told you so. This never would have happened if we had a weapon. Well, isn't there a question about whether the Israelis have the capability to take out any um, nuclear development, whether the U.S. is the only one that has the type of bomb, the type of hardware that it essentially could take out there that's very deep. Yeah, let's just, let, I, I, I yeah. suffice it to say we could do a better job than they could, yeah. right? Um, the other thing about the war scenario is that I think we should, you know, probably the most important lesson from Iraq and Libya is, man, war is unpredictable. War has significant unintended consequences that you cannot think about before you start. And what an attack on Iran would bring in terms of stability there stability elsewhere, it's very hard to say. Um, here's a good question. How do we have an honest and effective conversation with the Sunni Muslim world in which we address the unique violence in the theology of Islam and help them to modernize and pacify? Great question. Great question, and the answer is we can't. We can't. The United States of America can't. And we can't because we don't have any credibility in a discussion about what how a religion should think about itself and how people who are Muslim should think about their own religion, right? That is an extremely important discussion that has to happen between Muslim leaders and their people, between Muslim clerics and their congregations, between Muslim teachers and their students and Muslim parents and their kids, right? And President Sisi in Egypt just started that conversation with his own people with a remarkable speech that said that we have to start thinking differently about our religion. We have to get rid of this violent strain of our religion. This part of our religion that says violence is okay. It's gotta go. But it's not just Sunni. Right, I mean, right. I mean, there, there are Shia extremists too. Hezbollah, right? Mm -hmm. Killed more people prior to, more Americans prior to 9-11 than any other terrorist group. Um, so that's a conversation that has to happen inside Islam. It's not a conversation that we can, we can have with them. And who's leading on that front in the Middle East? Two people, um, you know, King Abdullah of Jordan um, has, has been trying to do this for a long time. He doesn't have as strong a voice as the president of Egypt has, the most populous Muslim country in the world, long the leader of the Muslim world, Arab world. Um, so I think the conversation that President Sisi just started is incredibly important. Uh, another interesting question here. What do you think of the theory that the U.S. should be content to watch ISIS and Assad forces fight each other to drain each other and Iran? Yeah, so interesting. Um, remember earlier I said that the number one risk that ISIS poses to the United States is the threat to stability in the region, right? The threat that what's happening in Syria and Iraq spreads, right? If you could contain the fight to Syria, I'd be all for that strategy. But the the risk is that it spreads and we cannot have that happen. So I, I'm, I'm concerned that that strategy doesn't deal with the containment problem that we need to deal with. Is a cyber attack inevitable? Yes, a big cyber attack is inevitable. And what, what would that look like? What's the worst case scenario? Um, so the three, the three big vulnerabilities, financial system, energy infrastructure, and telecommunications, right? So when North Korea attacked Sony, it basically such shut Sony down, shut the Sony network down for an extended period of time. Even shut, turned their phones off for an extended period of time. Um, so multiply that by you know, a part of the nation or an entire industry, yeah, I, it, it, it's inevitable. Uh, let's give Mike Morrell a big round of applause.